Welcome, I'm Denise Graves, and you're watching Opera America's Oral History Project. Well, um, let's get started. And, um, you know, you probably know I asked this question of everyone. Peter, who, who brought you to your first opera? My mom and dad. Um, and I remember that chronology so vividly because the first, they were still Texaco Metropolitan Opera Saturday broadcast back then that I recall uh, so strongly was about 10 days before the first grown up opera I saw, grown up in quotation marks. And to prep me for it, since they know that, knew that I'd been bitten by the opera bug, when my older sister had gone to a student matinee performance at Connecticut Opera in Hartford of Verdi's Trovatore, she was not bitten by the opera bug, but they did the same prep to try to get her ready and into the idea of the art form. Um, and I just thought it was wonderful. I just couldn't get enough of Trovatore. It was the recording with Leontine Price and uh, Richard Tucker and uh, Rosalind Elias and Leonard Warren. And, uh, and they thought, well, we'll take, take Peter to the opera. So it was La Boheme with Mirella Freni. And to prep me for it, they bought the complete EMI recording of it with Freni and Nikolai Gieda and Thomas Schippers conducting. And it, as I said, it, about 10 days before that particular live performance in December of 1966, the Met broadcast um, Turando with Zubin Mehta conducting their first season in their Lincoln Center digs with Birgit Nielsen, Franco Corelli, and um, Bonaldo Giotti in the other lead parts. Now, I'm at a stage in life, um, nearly 65 years old, where I have less than zero use for Turandot most of the time. But in a strange way, although my parents were a little bit concerned that it was really gory for a child, I thought it was just the best thing Ever. And the sounds coming through the radio intoxicated me. So I was listening to that one with my mom and my maternal grandfather, Luigi Marianella, who, like a lot of people from the old country, loved opera, had 78 RPM records of Judy and Caruso and this one and that one. Um, and I, I was just bitten hard by the opera bug, including that performance of Bohème, and I never got over it. So for Christmas and birthdays, I got complete LP recordings of operas and checked them nonstop out of our public library, um, mm -hmm. along with piano vocal scores. And that's how it all got started for me. You know, I did not realize that you came to opera as a legitimate um, son of, you know, it Italian heritage here. So uh, th this was a a familial art form when it was passed along to you. Absolutely. My dad got into it through my mom, um, but it was basically her parents kind of inculcating her. Uh, you know, I, I, there's a story about when I was a wee small lad. Um, she had a recording that she loved of Ferruccio Tagliabini singing the aria, um, it's Je crois entendre encore. I think it's Mi par udire ancora, if it's uh, Pescatori di Perle. And she would play it nonstop while she was ironing in our basement. And one of the whoopings of a lifetime I ever received was when she took a phone call and I put that recording on the ironing board and ironed it. And I found that it became pliable. So I started twisting it into a sculpture. Oh boy, was I in trouble that day. So I think that there was a kind of guilt of if you can't beat them, join them that basically led me to say, if she feels that strongly about it, there must be something to this. Wow, wow, that, that, is, uh, that is a wonderful story. When, when did you, you decide that opera was going to become a part of your professional life? You know, that okay, I have to grow up, I have to have a job, and opera is going to be what I do. When, when did that occur? Um, I think that that started when I was in college. I was taking, I'd begun in the elementary school with the FLES program, foreign language in the elementary school, taking French. Um, and I took Latin in high school, which meant that um, Italian came very easily to me. On top of which, as Grandpa Marianella got older, 
he tended less and less to speak in English to my mom. He would just talk to her in Italian and she would answer him in English or a combination of half Italian, half English. So that came very easily to me and I took German. And I began uh, working first as an assistant stage manager and then a stage manager for the productions that were done every winter and every spring in collaboration between the opera department at the Yale School of Music and the Yale School of Drama, making use of um, the students who were in the design department at the School of, of Drama and the music staff like John Mauchery as conductor or Otto Werner Müller as conductor um, and Phyllis Curtins and the other voice faculties, voice students. Um, and I enjoyed it. I thought, well, this is, this is nice. You know, I basically am spending time doing what is my hobby, except that I'm working at it. And someone said, well, you know, there's always a demand for that in the field. I had much higher ambitions in, in originally and thought that I wanted to be a stage director for opera. And bless their hearts, Yale gave me two fellowships. One was in between my junior and senior year. Um, and I spent part of that in Milan transcribing parts of Verdi's ultimate flop opera, King for a Day, Un Giorno di Regno, that were alternate pieces, um, a duet and a trio that never made it into the final um, autograph score. They're now, by the way, at, uh, I believe they're still at the um, American Institute for Verdi Studies at NYU, or at least I believe them to be. Um, and the rest of the time I spent um, in Fiesole, a town outside Florence watching uh, the great baritone Tito Gobbi um, do master classes of Italian repertoire. Wow. Um, actually, a couple of people did pretty well for themselves among people that uh, were there that summer. An English soprano named Janice Cairns, who had a wonderful career at English National Opera until she missed the mattress and fractured her spine and the career came to an end. And an American soprano named um, Karen Hofstadt, who was from mm. Illinois. She was a real standout that summer. Uh, so there was that fellowship. And then the, for a full year after I graduated, I'd written to opera companies in Germany, Switzerland, Belgium, um, Italy, and where else? Oh, the Gleinborn Festival to gain permission to watch new productions of operas in rehearsal. So I started in Florence watching uh, Riccardo Muti conduct a, a Perform a production that was actually televised of Nozze di Figaro. Um, I saw Giulio Chazolet uh, directing a production of Werther with Alfredo Krauss at La Scala. And I went to Hamburg to see Horn and Sonia Frizel in the Ponel, L'Italiana in Algeria, Gertz Friedrich in uh, uh, Tristan in, at the Deutsche Oper in Berlin with Baron Boim conducting. Um, and while I was abroad, I couldn't get people back in the States to answer the question, do I need a graduate degree in theater administration or should I just start working in the field? And everyone was evenly divided. I did get into the MFA program at the Yale uh, School of Drama, but the idea of a couple of more years in New Haven, uh, Connecticut and paying more tuition paled in comparison to applying for real jobs. So from overseas, I applied to what I thought was every opera company in the US where I wanted to work. Um, and I got invited to do two um, as assistant stage managers, Houston Grand Opera, who were still performing in Jones Hall at that point, and what is now Washington National Opera. Um, but I interviewed within a week in August of 1980 for both jobs. And Washington's role at that point was to make um, Houston seem that much more hellish in terms of climate mm -hmm. and a place to live than Washington, DC. Plus my sister was already living here. Um, so I chose Washington and that's where I've ended up off and on spending the better part of my adult life, as you know. So Peter, what was the first opera job here in the US? Um, it was as assistant stage manager at Washington National Opera, and the very first production I wor worked on was a new production of Un Ballo in Mascara, um, conducted by Cal Stewart Kellogg, directed by Frank Rizzo, designed by Zach Brown. Um, it was a pretty good cast, with the exception of the Bulgarian tenor Mikhail Svetlev, who did, um, I can't remember whether it was 
the Boston or the uh, Swedish. So I can't re recall whether he was Ricardo or Gustavo. It was supposed to be set in this kind of generic Northern Europe, as I recall. But the rest of the cast was very good. It was uh, Teresa Giliscara in a role debut as Amelia, Leonucci as, uh, as uh, Ankerstrom or Re uh, Renato, uh, Janice Hall was Oscar. Mm. Um, and in part, I was hired because Svetlef and Giliscara communicated with one another in German, but Frank Rizzo didn't speak German, and I did. And Leonucci didn't really speak English. Um, and Frank kind of spoke Italian, but it was because of the language skills that I was initially brought on board, I think. How interesting. Now, you know, in just what you recited, you've mentioned so many names, and this is part of our effort here in creating an oral history. You know, Frank Rizzo, um, really an important presence in American opera uh, at the time that you entered the field and for, for years, years after. Tell us a little bit about Frank. Uh, Frank was a, a, a thing as a stage director, um, but he also served as dramaturg for Washington National Opera. Um, a, an amazing person in terms of both his writing ability and the ability to, to think like a dramaturg in terms of attaching history, literature, as it applies to the art form and the history of the art form. Um, he came into the field as an assistant to John Carlo Mainotti. And in a kind of interesting uh, twist, he went from being a total Mainotti acolyte to by the time he parted ways with Mainotti being sort of disillusioned with the overall oeuvre and the overall aesthetic of Mainotti as a composer. Uh, but that's what got him in. And it was the theatricality of someone about the same age when I first got bitten hard by the opera bug. He was a lad when he saw the original productions on Broadway of uh, The Saint of Bleecker Street and The Medium and got hooked. Yeah. And, and Cal Kellogg. Yeah. Yeah. He and John Mauchery, who was music director of the Kennedy Center Opera House Orchestra, did most of the conducting duties back then. We occasionally had um, a Gerald Schwartz or someone else as a guest, but uh, the two of them had the lion's share of the conducting duties. And in those years, was uh, Martin Feinstein the head of the opera company? He was the entire time that I worked there. And of course, and he had been a protege of the uh, legendary impresario Salt Hurok. That was his uh, early training. And, and um, did you have much contact with with Martin at that time, what was he like? Uh, you know, Martin was a character who had character. Um, I also adored his wife, Bernice. Uh, little case in point, Martin invited a group of us to his home in McLean for dinner one night. And with the rash stupidity of youth, with uh, Mitzislav Rostropovich as conductor of the NSO in those years, and Galina Vishnevskaya, Still singing, we would, and the Zieglinde was someone who had a lovely lyric soprano that she beefed up to sing hochdramatische roles. The uh, Zieglund was a very handsome German tenor, and you would know the name, but I'm not going to say it to protect the innocent. Uh, and both of them were in very poor form the afternoon of the Valkyrie. Uh, Mati Salminen, on the other hand, the Finnish bass who was doing Hunding, was absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. So act one is over, and it, forget about your memories of Lotte Lehmann and Lauritz Melchior or uh, Leonie Riesenek and John Vickers, who were pick your poison, forget about them. They weren't doing their thing that afternoon. And it was a beautiful spring day, and I went out to the plaza that overlooks uh, the river, and Bernice and I both lit up cigarettes because that's what we did back in the 1980s. And she rolled her eyes and she said, I don't know about you, but I'm rooting for Hyundai. He's the only one on that stage that can sing. <laughs> that is so funny. I never knew Bernice well, but uh, a couple of times and certainly what I experienced is, is similar to that. You know, it occurs to me and I had not planned on, on asking you about them, but here we are talking about a ring cycle and Votan. Of course, because you were resident in Washington, uh, I remember well you, uh, that, that Tom Stewart and Evelyn Lear were there in Washington. Uh, and 
you you had you know an extended you know friendship relationship with both of them. Um, some recollections of of Tom and Evelyn. Um, Tom made peace with having had a, a, an illustrious storied career that was then in the past. Uh, by the time I got to know them quite well, I don't think Evelyn really ever gave up on the idea of there somehow being a comeback. I remember a dinner at their country club in Rockville, right after all of us had seen the Broadway tryout in the Eisenhower Theater at the, Terrace, uh, the Kennedy Center of Masterclass with uh, Zoe Caldwell and notably Audra McDonald singing Lady Macbeth's entrance aria sounding as good as Shirley Verrett in her prime and come to find out she had coached it with her carousel co-star, Shirley Verrett. And Evelyn had two idées fixes over dinner that night. One was that someone needed to mount a production of Masterclass for Evelyn playing the role of Maria Callas. And the other was that Audra McDonald needed immediately to stop this nonsense of being the star of Broadway and screen and television and pop music and study classical vocal music with Evelyn so that she could take her rightful place as the next Evelyn Lear. Um, and Tom in his gentle sort of way said, oh honey, you could never remember all those lines. Well, we could get a prompter. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it was interesting. Um, I think oh, that yeah. while, while It was Tom so was wonderful, alive, you know, when I, when I'd go to their home for dinner and just taking out old recordings, private recordings and sitting they're listening to Tom and Evelyn with Tom and Evelyn. It was just a remarkable, you know, set of dinners. Yeah. Yeah. So when you entered the field, there you were working at Washington National Opera. Did you have a role model where you had keenly learned the repertoire and probably observed the industry uh, just with your, your, your great intelligence. Did you have a role model? Was there someone Absolutely. you and wanted to be like? the interesting thing is that, uh, is that all, of, what does this say that all of my role models, but one perhaps, uh, were female. Uh, Artist Kranick mm -hmm. um, and my supervisor at Wolf Trap, Ann McPherson McKee, from whom I learned so much. When I took that job in August of 84, the job at Wolf Trap was the proverbial job that nobody in his or her right mind would want because it had switched hands about three times in five years. And Frank Rizzo's advice was, look, at your age, because I wasn't yet 20, how old was I? In August of- 20, 27, 26, 27. Exactly, I, would, I had just turned 27. And he said, at your age, no one is gonna give you a, a general manager job. So just go in there, get two years worth of experience and then get the hell out like I did. And I thought, well, that makes perfect sense. Except that thanks to Anne McKee, who always had my back and from whom I learned so much, um, I, I, just, I just felt I was always learning something and I was always growing. But in terms of, of just looking from the top at the top of the field, Artis Kranick as general manager of the Eric Opera of Chicago was just an absolutely remarkable individual. And, and how did you come to know Artis or, or be introduced to her work? Um, you when know, I there was, you were in Washington, she was in Chicago. Exactly, but thanks to you, I became one of the Cub members of the Opera America Board of Directors when she was heavily involved. In fact, she may have been, whatever the title is, uh, president, chair of the board. At the time um, she was president of the board. Yeah, we changed the title later. Yeah, um, but just always had a knack for knowing what the right thing to do was, how to think strategically, how to never waste time, how to cut to the chase. She was just so admirable. And, and just that energy, that presence, the incredible uh, uh, charisma that she had. Yeah. So and you, actually, David Gockley, too. Um, yep. David Gockley, in terms of what he achieved in Houston, was uh, thoroughly admirable. Yeah. Uh, what he was Perfect. able to do there was just hats off to him. 
Yeah, a real trail trailblazer for sure. You know, when I when I think of your early career or the early part of your career, young artist development was was clearly a through line. And here you were taking a job with Frank Rizzo's advice at Wolf Trap, thus aligning yourself with the trajectory of young artists. But did it, it did it start out as a job and then become a passion? Was it really a passion you got to realize when you took the job at Wolf Trap? How did you yes. become so closely aligned with young artists? Uh, I don't know. It's kind of a, was it the chicken or the egg type of thing? Because it was also in the fall of 1984 that I served for the first time as an adjudicator for what's now the Metropolitan Opera La Femme competition. And it was for the district auditions here in DC with a very interesting pair of co-adjudicators, both of whom had just retired from DC institutions. Audrey Snap who had been tenured faculty for years at University of Maryland's Maryland Opera Studio, and Mata Wilda Dobbs, who of course, after Marilyn, uh, Marian Anderson broke the color barrier in 1955 at the Met, was one of those people that just had a great international career, mostly in Europe, but also at the Met and also a recording career. And I sort of felt it was more my duty to listen and learn from them, which I did. And a person who actually won in the districts was the regional winner that spring of 85, and then won as one of the top prize winners in New York and did well for a while. But I was also really fortunate because our first year of full young artists, my first full season of staging opera at Wolf Trap in 1985, we had some really good people who lasted a long time. And it was strange because Alan Glassman, who had just made the switch from lyric baritone to tenor, and Richard Croft were, all, were both several years older than me and had been in the field for a while. And I always sort of felt like they quite understandably were sort of like raising an eyebrow, like who is this punk? But we also had um, Dawn Upshaw that summer, a coloratura who did quite well for herself for a number of years. And in fact, did a couple of the roles uh, at the Met that she did for us, Barbara Kildoff. Uh, we had Loretta Bybee, Victoria Livengood, Gordon Hawkins, Eugene Perry. It's a good lineup that year. Um, Wolf Trap has had a number of incredible years. I, I remember, you know, the year when Stephanie Blythe and Emily Pulley, Michelle DeYoung uh, were all in, and Christine Gerke were all in one class. It was an amazing class. And all singing Handel. That's the thing. And everyone says, you know, now, oh, well, they can't sing Florida music, except that back then, they all did, including Eric Owens, who was Aquila in that same production of Julius Caesar that all the aforementioned were in. And they all could really move their voices. And I think for them, it was good. Uh, for everybody, it isn't. There are, no two are created exactly alike, but I think it was good experience for them in 1995. And then of course, you, you followed the young artist uh, track, you know, getting, getting to the Met and working on the um, the Lindemann program. So um, yep. you can continue to have this connection to young artists, uh, even as, as your career progressed. And also some of the singers that we present as part of our recital series are uh, emerging people. When our founder turned 90, the board wanted to do something to honor him. And his request, because he really missed the annual collaboration that vocal arts used to do with uh, the foundation that Marilyn Horn created, which existed for the express purpose of seeing to it that recital repertoire continued to thrive in the hands of the best of America's uh, classical singers. We would, with the Horn Foundation, present the DC recital debut of one of her up and coming young singers every year. And a lot of people for years and years said that they remembered the first Kennedy Center recital by, let's name three of those names, Christine Gerke, Stephanie Blythe, Michelle DeYoung, through the combined auspices of vocal arts and uh, the Horn Foundation. So uh, we presented a wonderful young Canadian mezzo-soprano virtually. Um, as our Gerald Perman emerging artist this past year, Emily D'Angelo. And uh, this year it will be a soprano who's finishing up with Houston Opera Studio, Elena Viazon. Uh, but some of the people who have done that since 2015 when we created it are already doing very well for themselves. And that's How exciting fantastic. to watch. Yeah. Well, I, and I wanted to, and, and you've, you've taken us right down this path, I wanted to talk to you about the song recital. 
Sure. And, you know, you and I, um, you know, are chronologically uh, the same age. And I remember when I was, um, you know, in college that to get tickets to a Janet Baker recital, Christo Ludwig, Dietrich Fischer Diesegau, that um, these, these song these recitals were just packed with audiences. Carnegie Hall at the time was Avery Fisher Hall. And then when I lived in Chicago, it was, whether it was Kathleen Battle or Jesse Norman, sold out recitals. Yeah. And these days, um, that, that just isn't as, uh, the song recital is not as popular as a form, does not bring out audiences the way it used to. And yet my sense is that a song recital is a very important part of an opera artist's development. So what, what is your view? Here you are leading Vocal Arts DC. What's your view about the place of the song recital in our opera world? I think that it behooves us to take a stance similar to what the artistic administration at the Met has been doing since the pandemic and since Black Lives Matter, which is to say aspects of the canon in the right hands, or in this case, the right brains and throats will always have a place. And we found this, whether it's Christian Gerhard with uh, Gerard Huber or uh, Anna Caterina Antonacci and Rosa Feola, doing music of their homelands. Those are rare bird sightings that will draw crowds. But we also need to take a good hard look at what we have in our own backyards and give everybody a place at the table. So this year's recitalists include David Portillo doing a program that includes Copeland and Britain, which has an openly gay man, and that's a change from when you and I were there. There were singers that were, uh, when you and I first started out, there were singers that were quietly out, mm -hmm. but that was about the extent of it. People like John Reardon, for instance, or Donald Graham, um, and also people that um, are composers of Latin X um, extraction, like Huastavino and Chapi. So we have that. We have Will Liverman doing songs by Black composers as well as by um, Ravel and Richard Strauss. And we've commissioned a new cycle for him based on poems by Edna St. Vincent Millay and um, music by Michael Ippolito. Um, Elena Villalon uh, is going to be singing another commission by a Latinx composer based in Minneapolis, Reynaldo Moya, as well as songs from all over the map, including by Maria Grever, so we're talking female and Latin X. Um, Morhina Stera, Shostakovich, Hugo Wolf. So it's a very, very mixed and very diverse program. And then uh, Jamie Barton with Jake Hagee at the keyboard. Um, some of Hagee's stuff, which is popular with our audience. Uh, when Susan Graham gave a recital to open our 25th anniversary, we commissioned the song cycle Iconic Legacies from Jake and Gene Shear which Jamie and Jake have now recorded and our audience will hear it for the first time since we gave its premiere. Um, so that's fun and it's exciting. And I think it's, it's a viable season, but it does mean that we're taking a slightly different look at what it means to be a vocal recital and what it means to be a presenter in the year 2022. And, and I, I think that direction, both in terms of repertoire uh, and the performers is just fantastic. I, but I, I wanted to think about the, the trajectory of a young artist, a singer, and whether you feel that some opera singers, all opera singers should experiment with and experience the song recital as a, an art, as a, as a facet of their artistry. I, you know, I'm going to paraphrase Stephanie Blythe, and I'm not going to get this exactly right. But she said in a couple of different interviews that you can ask a singer any number of questions. You know, is it difficult to sing in the Czech language? You know, is it difficult to sing a role that has such a wide vocal range of over two octaves? Uh, all of that, if the singer answers truthfully, can tell you something. And yet, nothing gives you a window into the soul of a singer as an artist so much as what it is that they choose to program on a recital and how it is that they react to the music 
through the words to communicate the emotions therein to a public. Yes, it means that you have to be naked, figuratively speaking. You don't have scenery, costumes, an orchestra, lighting, props, any of the comforts to uh, shield you. It really is just you and the music communicating, you as the vessel telling a story. But boy, does that tell us a lot of who you are. And if you can succeed in doing that without being scared, then I think it does absolutely make you a better artist. That said, is it for everybody? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I will say that sometimes you might be surprised by someone who you think, oh, but that's just a classic opera singer who then turns out to be a surprisingly vital recitalist. Case in point, Michael Fabiano, who opened our 2013-2014 season, which was the first one that I booked. And it was, in a sense, an old-fashioned recital in the sense that it was bookended by arias and then had songs in the middle. But boy, talk about total commitment in terms of communication to uh, the music and the words. Oh, and at the end of that season, the, the bookend of the, the season was in the spring of 2014, Larry Brownlee, um, who is for us just a golden charm. He can come and sing anything, including um, a recital that you would think half the audience when he did it in the spring of 2018 would say, well, I'm not sure that I want to hear half of this because it included the Schumann Dichterliebe. And then the second half was the Taishan Sori um, Cycles of My Being. And yet because he's Larry Brownlee, Washingtonians have basically come to trust that anything that he does is going to be moving and beautiful. So it, whether you bought the ticket because you knew you wanted to hear him sing Dichterliebe, or you were curious about the Taishan story, people came and they stayed and they applauded like mad. That's so, wonderful. Yeah. And I, I, it's too, I, I invoke something that Stephanie said with me in an interview some years ago. You know, when you're doing a song recital, you also don't have a costumer. You, you have to choose your dress. Yes. Um, you have to choose your hand gestures, your body movement. You don't have a stage director. And that to become you know, a, an artist who can stand on, on their own, you need to do a song recital where you are alone with the choice of repertoire, the clothes, the movement on stage. And um, it was really, I think she used the phrase an autonomous artist, uh, that the song recital was really essential in creating that sense of artistic autonomy. Yeah, absolutely. And that reminds me of something. Um, I won't name this particular artist, but uh, there was a recital presented not by us in the Kennedy Center Terrace Theater. Um, and the press release, which I received, had a quote from the artist saying that she wanted to underscore for the audience that each selection on the program had been handpicked by her. And I thought, what an odd statement to make. If you yourself as the artist presenting this program didn't select the music, who pray tell did? <laughs> Certainly the accompanist didn't say, hey, you there soprano, I'd like to hire you to come to a recital with me, which I'm going to select. I'm going to program. That's not how this works. You're absolutely right and so is Stephanie. It's it has idea. to be something where you you basically say the narrative arc is going to be thus, and hopefully there will be a narrative arc in terms of you you go beyond just what we call the uh, prefix, where you start with the standard Purcell or Handel, and then you do some German and some French, and then you end with some Copeland. Hopefully yeah. there will be something a little bit more original than that. Um, the in the in the year when you joined the Washington National Opera. Um, was there an American opera performed that season? Uh, which year, sorry? When you first joined Washington National Opera. Yes, Argento's postcard from Morocco. And uh, at Wolf Trap, did you do American opera? We sure did. Um, we did not only postcard from Morocco, but we did Conrad Sousa's transformations. Mm -hmm. um, gosh, what else did we do? We focused very heavily on uh, Mozart, because that, you know, that was kind of Frank's thing, is that if you could learn how to sing Mozart, you could learn how to do everything. Um, that, that continues to be pretty true. But 
I, I, I'm leaning in this direction. You talked about some of the wonderful composers you've commissioned at Vocal Arts DC. You know, a smattering of American opera, of Conrad Souza, of, uh, uh, of others at Washington National Opera. Um, are you pleased to see the volume of, by which I mean quantity, of American creativity these days, the burgeoning, bursting opera American repertoire? Does it please you totally. in terms of quantity? Does it please you in terms of quality? Um, in terms of quality, I think that that's always going to be, that's always going to be a situation in which the number of operas that actually last for a certain period of time and then truly stay the course, it will always be a really small percentage. I'm thrilled by the quantity of American creativity and the diversity of it. The fact that we now have more female composers, the fact that we now have uh, more diversity in terms of races, because the only way we're going to last, and it, it's a heck of a thing that the trifecta of 9-11, um, um, the Great Recession, um, Black Lives Matters, actually, no, it's, a, it's four rather than a trifecta, and now the pandemic, have forced us or have accelerated and exacerbated what we'd all been whispering to ourselves for a very long time, which is that the old formulas were really not working any longer. So when you see the tremendous success of fire shot up in my bones, when you see that the Met has pivoted on a dime and decided that they're gonna do champion next year after all with a wonderful cast, um, it's tremendously exciting. And here in DC, I give Francesca Zambello huge props from the time she took over of making a commitment to American works in a way that no administration prior to her own, except for maybe back when the company was still the Opera Society of Washington and performing at Lisner Auditorium and basically trying to model themselves on Santa Fe Opera, according to people like John Moriarty who were integral, integrally involved at that point. She has actually done choices in terms of American works that make the national that a former administration added to the company's moniker legitimate. And she's done it with both color conscious and colorblind casting. So I think that that's really good stuff. Of course, you, you mentioned Listener Auditorium and it makes me think of Washington Concert Opera, which was started by your recently passed husband, Stephen Kraut. Um, right. Where does concert opera fit in this spectrum? We've talked about song recital, of course, staged opera. Where's concert opera fit for you? You know, at the time that we founded it, it, it and I have to give Martin Feinstein, then general director of Washington National Opera, full credit, because far from resisting the founding of concert opera, he was completely supportive. He basically said, the more the merrier, the more of us there are, the better off we will all be. But at the time that we did it, it was during the time when WNO was not performing to give a little dose of opera in the spring and in the early fall and to do it with operas that weren't generally going to be performed by WNO and perhaps also showcase artists that either weren't singing here or rarely sang here. So um, it's great that they're now celebrating their 35th season um, good for them. Absolutely. And, and, and it's a, a wonderful organization. Um, you know, the, the opera audience tends to be visual. Uh, the opera audience likes to see sets and costumes. And yet there is a fervent uh, following for Washington concert opera. What about concert opera speaks to you? But in terms of the last concert opera performance that I attended, I will tell you that Rossini Zelmira another rarity that I'd never heard. Um, it was worth the price of admission, just so that when the character of Elo, the tenor part being sung again by Lawrence Brownlee, made his entrance about half an hour, 35 minutes into the first act and launched into the most astonishing <laughs> entrance aria, sweet cantilena, bravura up and down the yin yang, more notes above high C than you could ever imagine anyone could sing. The audience just went nuts. And the whole time that he was singing it, there was almost this church-like silence in the hall, no coughing, 
you know, no fidgeting, no nothing. And it was just the power of the music and the beauty and virtuoso technique of the human voice bewitching all of us together as a community as he told that story. And that yeah. for me is something that we should all cherish. That's why we're there. And again, an opera that would not be staged. You know, there, there's yeah. no company that I can imagine is going to spend a lot of money staging and building sets and costumes for Zilmira. And how wonderful that yeah. you then got to be completely inspired and lifted up by, by Larry's performance. Absolutely. And, you know, except for the Rossini Opera Festival in Pesaro, you're absolutely right. Here in the States, um, especially as we're coming out of pandemia, I think that there are certain things that we shouldn't expect to return to the rep anytime too terribly soon. And again, a wholesale shift in the rep may be in the offing. We just don't know. Are there any other trends in opera in this country that captivate you either because you're really delighted to see them because they upset you a little bit? Are there other, are there other trends you think about in American opera today? I'll tell you what pleases me greatly is that when you and I first entered the field, uh, there were African-American female singers, but the number of African-American male singers were few and far between. It was easier to find them on the roster of New York City Opera than it was on the roster of the Met. And there's the famous uh, quote that Simon Estes shares of Leontine Price tell him, go to Europe. <laughs> You're going to be so much better off if you... Uh, hitch your wagon to the German system and build your repertoire and your career there because otherwise it's going to take you a very long time if forever to build a reputation like you will over there. And of course she was completely right. We've made some progress in that regard in terms of there now being many more men of color um, and also in terms of Asian singers. Um, it used to be that if there were singers from Asia they were sopranos and they were pigeonholed as Shocho San and Liu. Um, you know, we have presented as our permanent emerging artist recitalists both uh, the Chinese soprano Ying Fang and the uh, Korean Hera He Sang Park. And when Ms. Park was here, she said that the joke is that when she sees Ying, with whom she's friends, uh, passing one another in the corridors at the mat. She says, oh, hello, Hye Sang. <laughs> and Ying says, oh, hello, Ying. And then they just laugh because that happens to them all the time. As, as Hye Sang said, they only see Asian. And I said, okay, that's bad. But let's look on a bright side. Two of you are at the mat and you're rehearsing operas and neither one of you is cast as Madame Butterfly or Liu. So, it's better than it's better than we were 25 and 30 years ago when basically the Korean um, emigre Hei uh, uh, he Kyung Hong was uh, kind of the only fixture on the Met roster, um, singing all kinds of roles that were not Madame Butterfly. So we're getting there. It's just not fast enough, but it's yeah, it's just trending yeah. in the right direction. It's headed in the right direction. Progress is being made, but I share your wish that we could just get there a little bit faster. Yep. Uh, but, you know, as the Italians say, a beautiful day starts in the morning. So uh, luckily, we've we've gotten a start on it. Yep. Uh, Peter Russell, it is such a pleasure to hear your voice, to just witness your complete mastery of the repertoire of the languages of the history of opera and opera in America. I'm so grateful to you for spending the time with us today. <laughs> <laughs>